School's out, and 14-year-old Rachel Domus is running late. She misses her bus and starts the three-mile walk home. She never makes it. Although there's no evidence of foul play, the pressure is on Detective Gary Miko to find the girl quickly. Didn't have a crime. Uh, we didn't have a victim. We didn't have evidence of, of, of anything. But psychic Nancy Weber claims to see a crime unfolding. I know he's the killer. Can the rookie cop and the seasoned psychic team up to find the missing girl? Long Valley, New Jersey, the sort of place where no one locks their doors, a safe place to raise a family. So when 14-year-old Rachel Domas misses her school bus and doesn't return home, police don't immediately fear the worst. Her parents have called the police to report her missing, but the most likely explanation, Rachel is just out with her friends and has forgotten to check in with her parents. Phone rings, and it was the uh, vice principal of the high school, who I had a rapport with, who I knew quite well, um, asked me what, what we were doing about the missing girl. I believe two or three of her girlfriends were in his office at the time and were encouraging him to, to give us a call to, to try and find out what happened because they knew her and she, she wasn't that type of a girl. The call from the principal disturbs Miko. He goes straight to Rachel's home to meet with her parents. You had the immediate sense that something was wrong. The parents know their children well and they're telling you something's wrong and something's wrong. I remember seeing a photo of her on a wall. I recognized the face. The previous year, she was in grade school, and she walked to school, and we had a school post where we crossed kids in the morning and then crossed them again in the afternoon. So there's a, a definite human factor that comes into play, and also just knowing her personality as little as I did, I couldn't imagine her as a person who would run away from home. Walked into her bedroom, looked for any kind of luggage missing, clothing missing, a note, any sign of her running away. And everything was intact. The only thing missing were the clothes that she wore to school that day and her books. Across town, psychic Nancy Weber's phone rings. It's a friend of the missing girl's family, and the woman is frantic. Oh, my God. This girl, Rachel, who lived down the lives down the block from us, hasn't come home from school. She's missing. I'm listening to this voice. And as I listen to the voice, images start flashing before me. I, I hear the scuffling, and I know it's leaves, and I know it, the smell of it is woods. I hear his voice. I see his eye wandering. I don't see his whole face. It's the smell of him, it's the smell of autos and gasoline and Everything moves very quickly, like rushing torrents of film, and, and that's why I have to go back over it and slow it down. Nancy envisions a young woman, but she's not sure if it's the missing teenager. And what can I do to confirm the image I have? Because I had an image of a girl, a photo. So I said to her, listen, uh, do you have a photo of her? I can get her yearbook. OK, so I'll put the woman to work and I'll be able to see if the photo matches what I see in my mind. Meanwhile, Detective Miko is totally unaware of Nancy's visions. All he knows is a girl has gone missing, and yet somebody somewhere must have seen her. What I needed to do is try and find someone that saw her. If she missed the bus and she was walking, let's try and track down some witnesses that saw this person, our, our missing person, walking um, from the high school that few mile walk to her home. And that was my goal. Rachel's route home would have taken her past a busy service station. Miko heads straight there. Most people aren't home during the week, during the day. Um, so let's start with someone that you know is up and down the street on a pretty consistent basis. And what I came up with was um, the owner of the station and several employees telling me they saw a vehicle, a green Volvo, parked up a hill uh, off of Fairview Avenue, just off the roadway into the woods just slightly. And it was there for several hours during the course of the day. 
they recognized the vehicle as uh, belonging to a former employee of the gas station, uh, Michael Manfredonia. And uh, he actually walked into the station that day claiming his car broke down and needed some help. Maybe he saw her, maybe he drove past her. Maybe he was a witness. That's, that was my, my hope, that he saw her. I, I found out that he lived in Chester Township, the next town over. And I rang up the detective there to get a little background on Michael. And he called me back and said that he was arrested for, I believe, receiving stolen property. I asked for Michael's address um, and wanted to stop by and visit him. He supplied that information. I hung up the phone. I was getting ready to go. And the detective called back from Chester Township, telling me that Michael was in their headquarters um, at the moment, just walked in and was checking on the status of his community service. Miko is feeling lucky. He's got his first solid lead. He brings Manfredonia in for questioning. It's only been three hours since Miko was first assigned to the case. A gut instinct tells him that the man he's talking to might be somehow involved with the disappearance of Rachel Domas. He wrote an incredibly detailed statement, almost covering each minute that he was there. He tells me his vehicle breaks down. He's able to back it up a hill off the roadway walk around for two or three hours, got back at his vehicle, started it, and drove home. How does that happen? How does that happen? And I, I asked if he had possibly saw this girl walking at any point in time, and he, he told me no, he, he didn't think so. I remember asking, are you sure with all that walking around that you did, you didn't see her anywhere? You didn't pass her? You didn't, when you were you know, near your vehicle, when you were walking on Fairview Avenue? because I understand she missed the bus and, and you didn't pass by her? And the answer was no. Miko calls in another detective for help, George Duker. I was in a meeting and he said, I need your help now. I need you right now. And he had some bad feelings about this missing person case and came, I came to headquarters, he briefed me and ultimately I had those same bad feelings. 20 miles away, Nancy Weber is about to have her worst suspicions confirmed by the friend of Rachel's family who had originally contacted her. There's a knock on my door. The woman comes in. She has a yearbook in her hand. She opens to the photo of Rachel, and I look at it. I instantly know it's confirmed that the images I have, for me, match it. Nancy is certain the girl is dead. Now she needs to convince police she can help. Every cop knows the first 48 hours in a missing person's case are critical. Evidence is still fresh. People's recollection of events still intact. It's been less than 10 hours since 14-year-old Rachel Domas was last seen at her high school. Detective Gary Miko might have a witness, but there's no evidence of foul play. Nobody even knows if the girl is alive or dead. At the exact same time, psychic Nancy Weber has a clear and terrifying vision of the girl's plight. And the image was a sequence of his grabbing her and repeatedly, I think, raping her. But along with the vision, the name Michael. Weber has no way of knowing that the police have a man named Michael in custody but she has no doubt that she has been a psychic witness to a monstrous crime. She wastes no time contacting authorities. She calls the one police officer she knows she can trust. And I call Ross English, who was chief of detectives at Mount Olive at the time, and I worked with him on a lot of cases. I said, hey, Ross, I just got some woman who came to me who showed me a photo of Rachel Domas in Long Valley. She's been missing since yesterday, I think. She's, she's in the woods. He said, let me make some calls, I'll be back. I'm praying I'm wrong and that Rachel shows up somehow. Back in Long Valley, detectives Gary Miko and George Duker are still questioning Michael Manfredonia. He's being very polite and says he wants to help, but the detectives feel certain he's hiding something. George was a little more direct with him on trying to be clear. We just weren't buying it up front. He, he was talking about how his car had broke down and, you know, he had worked nearby in the area, and he took a walk toward Norite Road. Just none of it really made sense. And at the same time as he's speaking, we're thinking about her possible actions as she left school that day. And the time frame and all of that just truly 
had us believing that, that this individual was involved. And finally, he said, Michael said, I want a lawyer. Officers have been sent to search his home and car, but they turn up nothing. In the middle of it all, Gary Miko gets a call from Ross English. He tells him Nancy Weber's horrific story. Yeah, it was sort of like, yeah, okay, uh, Ross, I'll give her a call, and I believe I put the note in my pocket. And at some point in time, I would give this person a call. Um, again, I believe my job at that point was just to track down people that could have seen her, witnesses. So I didn't call this psychic back right away. Even if Gary had called Nancy right away, there was no way they could hold Michael Manfredonia any longer. And it was so frustrating because here we had a suspect that we truly believed was responsible for something we didn't even know yet. Certainly nothing good, but we didn't have her. Then the real kicker, the detectives are given an ultimatum by their boss, charge Michael Manfredonia or let him go. 12, 14 hours after he was initially um, picked up, we were directed to release him and take him home. It's 3 a.m. Miko and Duker reluctantly drive Manfredonia home. They're both certain they're making a big mistake. Gary and I got in the car, and we drove him home, and we dropped him off, and we just had such bad feelings about dropping him off, and we didn't want to let it go. And uh, there's an abandoned railroad bed that runs parallel to Fairview Avenue, and George and I, in an unmarked patrol car at 4 a.m., still drove slowly down this railroad bed, just looking for any sign, any evidence of a crime, maybe our victim walking, anything. We just, we didn't want to let it go. And that was, that was the last thing we did that, that day, that long day. Friday morning, 8 a.m., 17 hours since Rachel Domas was reported missing. Gary Miko remembers the note about the psychic. He gives her a call. I have a completely open mind. If a psychic has something to offer, I've got an ear. Finally, I could say something. I needed somebody to say something to. She said to me, I'm going to tell you something that I didn't tell the family, and I wouldn't do that. She's dead. And a boy named Michael did it. Miko is stunned. He and Duker had a man named Michael in for questioning for hours. If Nancy is right, he had almost certainly released the girl's killer the night before and given him a ride home. How did, how did she know that? How did she... How did she get that? No one knew that we had a Michael in custody. Gary appeared uh, 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 over the phone to be, I need, I need this, I need more, give me more. Uh, and at the same time, I heard this groan of, oh, we had him for hours here. We were questioning him. But so far, the police haven't any evidence that there's been a crime, yet Nancy claims to have seen it take place. I am watching in sequence event of someone, male, exploding all at once. I felt like this is somebody who had contained most of his rage to a degree and then just blew it all at once. At the same time that Miko is talking to Weber, George Duker is leading a team scouring the area where Michael's car was last seen. I got a radio transmission from one of the search teams telling me that they just found her pocketbook in the woods. I immediately raced from where I was to where they were and had entered into the woods. I get out of my police car. I'm running now in the woods toward the search team. They call me back again. We just found one of her shoes. I'm thinking at this point, this is tremendous. She, was, she came home from school late. She, for whatever reason, was in the woods. She tripped, she fell, she broke her leg, she couldn't get up, she couldn't get help. And then I go to the crime scene, and they're just, they're all standing there in, in just disbelief, looking at how he had partially buried her body. What he had done to her, the trauma of that homicide, was just, was just unbelievable. I was awoken by a phone call from one of our officers who was um, upset. We, they had found her body. Um, they had found her buried, partially buried in a, uh, in a, a hole, like a big ditch, and uh, partially covered. And uh, I was on my way in. I dismissed everybody, and I sat with her body, her and I, for about an hour and a half, 
while we got forensic people on site and we brought them in closer and closer. On the way, checking every rock, twig, stone, branch, anything we could that might be of evidential value. You arrive at the scene and, and now you're, what you're hoping you wouldn't have to see, you have to see. What you're hoping you wouldn't have to deal with, you have to deal with. With the incredible accuracy of Nancy's visions in his mind, Miko knew immediately what he had to do. Now you're, you, you need to put a case together at this point in time. You need to find your suspect. Michael's your suspect. Michael's the only person so far that was put there. We knew we then had to find him again. So it was all there. It was all there. Gary Miko and George Duker rush to the Manfredonia home, but he is not there. His parents tell them that earlier in the day, he had walked back into the heavily wooded mountainous area behind the home, but no one had seen him since. The detectives are devastated. 24 hours ago, they had a criminal, but no crime. Now they have a crime, but no criminal. I, I don't know why he decided to just take a walk. There was no press involved in terms of her body being located. Once again, police assemble search teams, but this time they are looking for prime suspect Michael Manfredonia. We had dogs, tracking dogs involved, and uh, we were unsuccessful that, that day. I believe it was Saturday, and, and didn't locate him at all on Saturday or any sign of him. Miko replays the conversation with Nancy Weber earlier that day. She'd said the killer smelled like oil and gasoline, and that fits. Manfredonia worked in a gas station. She knew his name was Michael, and long before police had the evidence, Nancy Weber knew that Rachel was dead. Could she also hold the key to where the killer was hiding out? And she had said to me, you know, just, just bring me something that he touched, that he handled some personal belonging. And, um, you know, maybe that would help me, you know, tell you where he is. I could not tell him where Michael was. I needed to make the contact with a person who had connections with Michael. And through that link, I can travel. Before Detective Miko could officially meet with Weber, he needed permission from the county prosecutor. You know, we never used a psychic before on anything. So this would have been a first. And clearly with a major case, you needed to get approval from at least our prosecutor's office uh, before any of that interaction could happen. Sometimes when I work with law enforcement, I know that I work far better with them than I work with some of the families. and that I get far more results when I work with law enforcement because they're in direct contact sometimes with the evidence, even if they didn't see the killer or know it. They've touched the evidence in some way. And the prosecutor wasn't getting a good feeling about this at all. He didn't like that type of attention drawn to the homicide case, thought that, that it would get too much media, too much hype. It wasn't the direction that he really wanted to go. Gary and I then talked privately, and Gary said, what do you think? And I just said, do what you got to do. How can it hurt? How can it hurt? She might have some information here that will absolutely, you know, turn this thing around. And he went off to see Nancy. Gary Miko decides to defy the prosecutor and set up a meeting with Nancy. The discovery of Rachel Doma's body has turned the case of the missing girl into a full-scale homicide investigation. Prime suspect Michael Manfredonia has disappeared. Going against a direct order from the county prosecutor, Detective Gary Miko arranges a meeting with psychic Nancy Weber. He thinks she might hold the key to finding the murderer. But as he travels to meet her, doubts begin to creep in. Was there some something that she knew about this crime? Was she involved? Yeah, who knows? I didn't know. I mean, again, because of those reasons as well, it, it was worth meeting with her to see what she had. And I'm driving there and I'm thinking, okay, so you're meeting somebody, you don't even know if it's Gary Miko. You've never met him before. You don't know if it's really a cop or some nut on the phone who called you. What are you doing? You're doing it anyhow, you know that. <laughs> and so I have this nice discussion as I'm driving there and I pull up alongside him and I have a handbag and I get in his car and as I get in, I see his, the inside of the car is a cop car. He's real and he immediately can I see your handbag? Thinking, OK, sure. What does he think I have, a gun? And I'm thinking, maybe a weapon. Let's make sure I'm not being tape recorded 
um, let's just get all this out of the way. So, uh, you know, this person who might be a publicity seeker or some sort of a problem individual, I just want to make sure that, you know, there's some safety zone here where I'm, I'm comfortable and she's comfortable. He hands me this wire, kind of noose-like wire. And I'm saying, it's Michael. This was his. He's used it. He wants to use it on him. He couldn't. Suicidal. He's on the other side of the mountain where he killed her. He's on the opposite side. And as I see it, and I can still picture them, there are two huge drums. Normally, I can't tell you, but I knew 55-gallon drums, big drums. Now, she said, you know, he's, he can see you. He's, he's up on a hill. She paused. He, he's groggy. He's, he's out of it. He's, he's overdosed on something. Um, he's almost, you know, delirious or delusional. Or, she was just talking about how he was, his, his mindset, he's, he's physically, he was tired. He was, he wanted to go home. He, 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 he can't go home because he knows you're there. You know, he, he sees police cars come and go. And uh, so he's afraid, but he, he desperately wants to come, go home. Sometime on Sunday evening, a decision was made to place a Chester Township police officer in the Manfredonia residence, just in case Michael came home again. And I grab a piece of paper, back of something, and I make a very rough sketch of where the gallons of drums are in a hill with pools of water. And she said, you're going to catch him. And she looked at me and she said, real soon, at that exact moment, my police radio, which had been quiet most of the night, on the police radio, you could hear that Chester Township officer on his walkie-talkie say, all units, he's in the home now. And I said to her, you have to leave, and sort of opened the door and kind of booted her out of the car and told her I'd be in touch and thank you. And Gary starts the car shifting, and I jumped out of the car. And he sped away, and that was it. As I'm racing towards the home, I'm thinking about this encounter and floored by, by what just happened to me. Gary arrives on the scene just as Manfredonia is being put in an ambulance. He jumps in, reads Manfredonia his rights, and accompanies him to the hospital. Once again, Nancy Weber's prediction proved to be uncannily accurate. 72 hours after Rachel Domus was first reported missing, Gary Miko and George Duker have brought her killer to justice. For 11 years, the 11 years that followed Rachel's death, I tried to deny emotionally what I felt about this case. Feelings of being vulnerable, feelings of being a father of, of daughters, feeling of, again, this, the same thoughts and questions I had when I sat with Rachel at her crime scene. How could this happen? How could this happen? And could we have prevented it at all? No, it's, it's 20 years later, and it's, it's still close under the surface. It's still there. Nancy Weber had been right about a lot of things. Her psychic feeling that the killer was somehow connected with the smell of oil was spot on. Manfredonia was a car mechanic. The location where he was found was surrounded by oil drums, just as she had described. She was also correct about his being suicidal. Manfredonia told police that he wanted to take his own life, and he was high on an overdose of cold medicine when arrested. On Monday, September 16, 1985, Michael Manfredonia confessed to murdering Rachel Domus in a blinding, frenzied rage. He's currently serving a life sentence at New Jersey State Prison.